Harry's wife, the queen of exaggeration. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. Narcissists are prone to exaggeration. It's part of their grandiosity and the delusion within which they operate when looking at the outside world. You went on holiday to Tenerife, they went to Tenerife. You have a forehead, they have a five head. They've got a television like yours, but theirs is bigger and better. Not only do they have to outgun you, but whatever they have done, whatever they have seen, whatever they have achieved, it's always bigger, better, further and faster. This is because that provokes. It provokes reactions, be it, wow, that's amazing, you're so talented, or I don't believe you, that never happened. Either way, It provokes a response in the listener, which means that fuel is provided. Naturally, the narcissists would prefer that you're awed and amazed by their supposed achievements. However, even where you challenge it, you're still providing fuel, so one out of two ain't bad. And of course, the narcissist will then do down your challenge by suggesting, why are you saying you don't believe me? and perhaps throwing a pity play in your direction, or insisting that it's true, and roping in a lieutenant to confirm that that's the case, so you feel silly for having challenged the narcissist, and end up backing end up backing down. The fact is, the narcissist is prone to exaggeration because the narcissism demands it. Being mundane is no good. If you think about it, what does Harry's wife offer? moderately good-looking woman who was a mediocre actress. There the story ends. Not a lot to work with, really, is it? There are plenty of people on the planet who are far better looking than she is. There are plenty of other actresses that are far more accomplished than she is. So the two strings that she has to her bow are already not particularly good in the scheme of things. Then... There are people who can actually write screenplays, books, speeches. There are people who are brilliant broadcasters. There are people who are entertaining and amusing. There are people who come up with original, profound observations and thoughts. There are people who are truly inspirational. She is none of those things. She is bland, she's boring, and she's beige. And therefore it's necessary for her narcissism, as if you imagined that it had a voice, It would go, hmm, we've not really got a lot to work with here, have we, lads? Okay, well, in order to get our hands on the prime aims, we're really going to have to up the ante with this one. We're going to have to make her come up with some tall stories. We're going to have to cause her to believe that she's friends with all of these famous people, even though many of them don't want anything to do with her. And indeed, as George Clooney memorably stated, We don't really know why we're here at the wedding. We don't know them. We're going to have to make her seem far more interesting, exciting and better than she actually is. And thus, the narcissism causes her to exaggerate. Some narcissists are well known for this. Billy Bullshit. That whenever they come along, you know that you're going to be in for a tall story. That whatever's happened to you... They've done it, plus some more. That you'll never guess what happened to me on the way here kind of person. And indeed, after a while, their stories, albeit tiresome, are often just become the subject of ridicule, and people just go along with it. Remember, Harry's wife believes all of this because her narcissism causes her to believe it. It revises history and makes her believe that the exaggerations and nonsense that she engages in actually happened. The problem that she has is as a consequence of the world stage that she's on, it's very easy for people to prove to the contrary. And Yann Moi, in the Daily Mail, picks up on this. She writes, Years from now, people will still be talking about the night when the Duke and Duchess of Sussex were, according to their own official statement, involved in a near-catastrophic two-hour car chase in New York resulting in multiple near-collisions involving other cars, pedestrians and police officers. 
hit the brakes for a moment to consider how the word near is called upon to do a lot of heavy lifting in this context. Near, as in a flaming meteor shower from Mars, was involved in a near hit on their car. Near, as in that near calamitous moment when King Kong nearly fell off the Empire State Building after climbing up to get a better view of this terrifying car chase. One, I might add, that is becoming the most famous hot pursuit in American history, right up there with Steve McQueen and Bullet, or O.J. Simpson's slow-speed freeway police chase nearly 30 years ago. Notice already that here, a seasoned journalist is openly taking the piss with regard to the level of exaggeration that is being demonstrated. Yet in the fevered aftermath of this incident, the most striking element is that everyone seems to be telling a different story. No two accounts match up. Well, of course, this is unsurprising because Harry's wife tells her story through the lens of her narcissism. The New York Police Department called the evening challenging, but without collision and not catastrophic, while New York City Mayor Adams said, I would find it hard to believe there was a two-hour high-speed chase. A bodyguard for the couple said he saw the paparazzi drive through 15 red traffic lights, but a celebrity news agency on the scene claimed it was an SUV in the couple's security detail, which was driving recklessly, not them. The taxi driver who picked up Prince Harry and his wife, Harry's wife, and her mother, Harry's wife's mother, for part of the journey dismissed any claims of putative disaster as exaggerated. However, the Archwell Global spokesperson reported that after a year in the Sussex employ, she had never experienced their vulnerability as much as I did last night. Perhaps she wasn't there the day they so beautifully peeled open their hearts and went to lay flowers at a Los Angeles military cemetery. Or she didn't personally witness their mutual distress when Bridesmaid 3 wore the wrong tights at their wedding. But I get the drift even if much of the US media themselves seem sceptical. As more details emerged, the picture became more complicated, wrote the New York Times archly, while the New York Post dubbed the couple the Duke and Duchess of Hazard. Meanwhile, major networks such as CBS hinted that the incident had been overblown, with Gail King revealing it was a scary moment, but police tell us it was not as serious as Harry and Harry's wife said. Of course, everyone has been so, so careful, voicing sympathy and understanding how, how being pursued by paparazzi, even for five minutes at five miles per hour, might be triggering for Prince Harry. One can certainly understand how his trauma response might be tuned to a higher pitch than most, and of course this is something that Harry's wife makes use of, and why he might have catastrophized the incident into something approaching a near-death experience, because for him, perhaps that's how it felt. For others, perhaps it merely mirrors the uncomfortable reality of being a celebrity on the mean streets of 21st century America, a place where one man's catastrophic car chase is another man's cruising the car block looking for a parking space. On Wednesday's news night, even Omid Scobie was rowing back, claiming the initial hyperbolic statement from the Sussexes had been made by people in an emotional state. Does that make it okay? No, it does not. What history needs is the truth, not the near truth. What we need is the NYPD to launch an investigation. Because the 18,000 police cameras that monitor nearly every godforsaken corner of New York City cannot tell a lie, nor allow tragic personal history to cloud their focus. Yet, quite honestly, I feel, writes Moi, that this is the Harry and Harry's wife story that has finally broken me. It's just never going to stop, is it? The entire world is forever going to be punished for what they see as the fault lines in their lives. All of us caught in the psychodrama of their need for the kind of high-profile public acclaim that produces revenue versus their demands for blanket privacy or else. For reasons still unknown, Harry and Harry's wife became involved in a bizarre Manhattan car chase that cynics might say looked from some angles like part of a scripted reality show. Well, it isn't for reasons unknown. You all know as a consequence of my work that it was necessary for Harry's wife to engage in these shenanigans in order to assert control over people for the purposes of drawing responses, which of course amounts to fuel. It might even look like an exercise in creating and harvesting content for some dread future Netflix project aimed at burnishing their premium victimhood credentials. Can't they just get on with their blessed and happy lives? Obviously not. And this is an important point to note. 
that for those of you that might look at the narcissist who has moved on without you, who's left you sprawled in the dirt as they ride off into the sunset without nary a glance over their shoulder at you, it invariably looks like the narcissist has succeeded and won and is content and happy. But it's not the case. The narcissist is always looking for that fuel, always has that nagging itch but doesn't know what it is, and in the same way, cannot experience contentment. Indeed, watch my video, Envious of Your Contentment. And it's the same for Harry's wife. She's wealthy, lives in a huge house with 45,000 flushing toilets. She has a doting husband, apparently two children. She's famous. She has lots of expensive clothing. She can afford to eat whatever fatty food takes her fancy. And yet, is she happy? No. She will make the pretense of doing so because her narcissism will drive her to, but she's not, nor is she content. She cannot enjoy the moment, because in each moment there's potentially a threat to control, or she has to continue to maintain that control. Moir describes them as the Kardashians with a coronet, the Osbournes with knobs on, the real royals of Monty Shit Show, and suggests that perhaps the sooner they accept that, the better that it would be for all concerned. She also suggests that if Prince Harry truly cannot cope with the flaming torch of fame, after the putting the match to it himself, if it really is all too painful, perhaps he should stay at home in the rescue coop and count his chickens instead. Moir says that's not a criticism, just an observation from a long-suffering bystander that it might just make him happier. What would make Harry happier would be for him to escape and perhaps go and live in Africa. But she's not going to let him escape. And furthermore, he's not going to be able to just stay home and count the chickens because she will not let him do so. Her drive for those prime aims means that he's part and parcel of all of this, that he becomes complicit with it all. That he is bound up in the tall tales, the lies, the revisions of history, and, of course, her exaggerations. What he didn't realise five years ago that he thought he'd met his soulmate, but who he was really marrying was the queen of exaggeration. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.